talk to you about the most recent um, pre-war card collector um, auction, uh, really around the vintage cards that sold in that auction because um, you know the prices are through the roof, and I don't know if this is really great for collectors uh, right now. Um, I know people are going to say enjoy the profits, but as collectors, I'm not sure this is good. And and I'm going to show that this has happened before uh, with specific cards. Now it's kind of happening across all vintage, which is, uh, I don't think, sustainable for one thing, because people really don't know what they're buying in terms of value and in terms of rarity. So um, I'm going to walk it through with you guys, and hopefully we can have a good discussion. Uh, and send me comments, your thoughts on this. But... You know, in reality, you know, in reality, this is not uh, great for collectors, um, for the investors and the short flippers. Uh, you know, these guys who are coming into this market thinking that you know they're going to turn these cards around in two or three months and make you know double the money, uh, triple the money. You know, and in some cases they might. Um, but history has shown that you know when this happens, there's a cratering of value after this kind of uh, activity happens, uh, where cards go up kind of out of out of the blue for no reason uh no discernible real reason uh and they go back to a more normal level and we'll show that to you over the time this has happened again so let's all keep in mind the frame of reference you want to think about is 2016. Uh, 2016 is when some really sketchy things are happening in the hobby in terms of auctions and there was shill bidding and a lot of things are happening in 16 that caused some card values to kind of go nuts for a little bit and then they come and they came back down and so that's something to keep in mind is that in a lot of cases the values came down in some cases it did change the base price meaning that even when it came down the level was still higher than what it was before so it had the effect that people wanted which is changing let's say the average base price of these cards to make them higher and in that case you know these guys in some cases did win they inc inflated the value of uh, that card um, quite tremendously so and, and, and you know at the end even though the cards came down from the high price uh, overall they were worth more money um, which in some ways you could say helps the hobby but I'm going to give you a few reasons why this isn't great for collectors and I don't really think it's great for the hobby because it will make people um, because for every winner there's going to be a loser for every person that made money during this time period there's going to be people who bought in at you know the tail end of, of this craze and it's going to end up holding cards that are worth a lot less than what they paid for and then you know they're going to be you know upset or you know it's just not good for for the hobby to go through these kind of artificial price links so we'll start with the first card and i'm just going to go through a few cards um the first one i'm going to go through is the 55 sorry 58 maze psa 7. so here is the historic sales uh, from vcp on the 58 and you can see right here, um, last night's card brought $2,247. The prior sale was $844. So basically it almost tripled in price from the last sale. Um, and historically this card has been, um, you know, a five to $800 card historically. So going back to 2016, when that first real big price, you know, swing hit, this card really wasn't affected. And that, that's another thing to think about too, is when that, you know the buyers group or whoever was trying to manipulate they picked certain cards um they targeted certain cards so not the whole hobby was hit so this is a good example of that where this card in 16 never really hit a huge price swing and then you know last night it, it just booms to twenty two hundred dollars for really no reason and it was you know i i think it was an okay card but this card is not rare then this grade so, you know, it's, that's why it's you know, never really gone through the roof. Now, an 8 or a 9, you know, the higher grades for 58s are definitely harder to find. But 6s and 7s, and this card you know, was a 7, is not hard to find. So, uh, another example of a pretty common card that went through the roof last night was the 61 Maze. And I will admit, the 61 Maze has gone up slowly over time. So, back in 16, it was a 300 to two, you know, 250 to $300 card. And, you know, it, it popped over three five hundred dollars a few times in 17. And then it started in 18. You saw it closer to five hundred dollars, you know, um, 450, you know, sometimes 400. But, you know, a lot of prices over 500 and it was pretty tracking to five hundred dollars 
all the way through August of last year, and then it started to slowly go above it a few times. There's some $700, then last night, 1085 So almost double of what it was normally tracking to. So again, for people who know, you know, 61s, for the most part, are not really rare, um, either in high grade or just finding the cards. So if you think you got a, a gold mine in 61 Tops cards, um, not really, because again, all most Hall of Famers in that set are not rare in terms of high grade PSA 8s and 9s. Uh, there's plenty to go around. Even when you get to PSA 7s, there, there's a ton. And for the most part, aesthetically, it's not the most uh, pleasing of 60 sets. And I like this set. It's one of my favorite sets because it was one of the first sets I ever collected as a kid. Uh, I collected the 61 Pirate Team set. And so that was the first thing that got me really collecting vintage cards. So for me, it's nostalgia. But for a lot of people, like the maze is an example of it. No hat, headshot, a lot of ugly cards in the set, especially around the Hall of Famers. So again, you know, it's not a great set to, to speculate on if you were going to speculate on vintage cards. Um, you know, there's a lot more sets out there. You know, like if I was going to speculate on any sets, it would be like 71 tops, 63 tops, 62 tops. You know, where the condition on those cards are hard to get just uh, out of the get-go. Like, you know, 62, 63 tops, 71 tops, hard to find in good shape. In 70s, uh, you may go 75 tops, even though that set is not really rare. Um, but, you know, people love that set. So, like, that's a pretty good spec. You know, the colored borders, tons of Hall of Fame rookie cards in that set. So, again, there's a lot more sites to, to speculate on for people thinking that they're going to uh really cash in on 61 tops is very odd to me but i think this just got caught up in the bidding frenzy of last night when people couldn't afford those higher value cards um you know so they kind of maybe purchase a card like this thinking like okay well i can't afford that 58 i was really going after which sold for um you know was selling for 800 dollars you know it went for 2200 dollars. so this seems like a like a steal um I think, you know, again, this kind of card is a great four to $500 card. If it were at 650 to $800, I wouldn't even really bet an eye because I think if it was a really good copy, the card last night was not a great copy. Uh, maybe I can show a picture of it. Um, because if you look at the, the card, and I'll show you a little picture, it's like, it had tons of print right through here, right? And for me, this is a pet peeve of mine on 61 Tops. I do not like a lot of print in this uh, color here. And so to me, it was just not a great uh, eight. And so even if I was going to speculate on one, I would not have speculated on, on that, that one last night. It was not a, a great copy of that card. Now, conversely, the 62 top 7.5 Aaron that sold last night was a good copy. But this card, you know, uh, from the base of about $700 to $800, you know, not even quite $800, um, you know, went to $1,600, know, $1, let's call it. So it doubled in price um, compared to previous sales. So the one prior was $900, so even that was $700 more. Um, and now it was a nice card. So if you look at the image here of this card, um, you know, this is a well-centered, for the most part, nice borders. It has, you know, some ding, some little bit of chipping down here, but overall, I mean, this card is, is nice. So I had less of an issue with the condition of this card, just the fact that it doubled on price. That's fine. You know, I think this is a kind of card, again, 62 tops, hard card to find in terms of good shape. So I have less of an issue with this card, people kind of specking on, but again, um, doubling in price, um, when, you know, all of last year it was selling, below $800 for the most part. Um, you know, here's one at 586. So, um, now the next card I'm going to show you was one of the big 2016, uh, buyers group speculator hits. And so it'll, it's very clear that this card was manipulated in 2016. So going back to 2016 and look at this, there's sales of 31,000, 23,000, 27,000, 25,000 clustered in this little time period right here. And then slowly it goes down, 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 all the way to 2018 to where it's selling consistently around $7,000. 
I bought mine in 2018 right around this period here and I paid around $8,000 for it at the National. Um, and the guy I bought it from had bought it around this time period. So he lost selling me that card. Um, probably about four to $5,000 when he sold me that card. But he was wanting to get out of it. Um, cause again, it was selling six in the $6,000 right here. Uh, cause you gotta remember it was around, uh, July. So it was you know, selling for $7,000. Um, I, I bought it, you know, some trade in for about $8,000. Um, so he got about probably closer to $9,000 for it. So it minimized some of his loss for it. I was able to get a really nice copy, but you know, he had lost money on that card. Um, and so many dealers are talking to me about this time period of uh, picking up inventory in 2016 because they saw this huge spike in some of these cards and thought, okay, I got to have inventory. I'm going to go out and uh, make some purchases. And so, like, even in this time period, like, if they were paying $10,000 for a man, uh, sorry, Clemente rookie PSA 7, um, they thought they were going to flip it for $15,000, $12,000, and they were going to make money on the card. Um, they held it too long and down here they're, they're losing $4,000, you know, now interesting to know this card has not sold since January 12th. And so the last sales was 11,850, um, which is double what it was selling for in 18. However, um, it's not the huge price jump we've seen on other cards, but because it hasn't sold. Now, if I go back and look at the Clemente that sold last night, okay, it was a 7.5. And I'll show you what that graph looks like. Uh, and there's that ridiculous spike. Um, again, going back to, uh, if I shorten the graph down to just 2016, you know, you'll see that spike right here where the card went, um, you know, from, from here to here. Um, you know, so this is the first spike out uh, $23,000 from a base of $7,000. So, um, you know, factor of three, you know, and then it goes from $17,000 to $40,000 last night. Again, you know, just very close to mirroring this kind of price increase from 2016 into 2021. So again, what happened after that price went to $23,000? Well, slowly over time, it halved. It went back down to $11,000. So, and again, this is a good card, okay? There's nothing wrong with a 55 Clemente. Nothing wrong. However, paying, if you pay $20,000 for it here and it was worth $11,000 here and you held, okay, you can say, well, now it's $40,000. So I, I end up making money, but the odds of it coming back down to $20,000 or below is very, very high. I think that is what the risk is. Um, I give you a few more examples of kind of spikes, you know, 52 tops mantle again in 16, it went from a card that back in, you know, back in 12, okay. was 70, you know, you know, $8,000, but you know, it can, you know, in 2015, it was a $30,000 card. It spiked to $66,000. So it went up double. And then here last sales were 38,000. Then it goes up to $1.6 million. You know, um, sorry, three hundred eighty-four thousand dollars to one point six. So I mean, a factor of five, right? So again, you know, a card that was selling for three to four hundred thousand dollars goes to one point six million dollars in one sale. You know, why? Uh, obviously, it's an iconic card. And so the common thing here is, you know, and what people are terming this as, people collecting the greats of all time, the iconic cards, collecting and and, but you can't convince me that a 61 tops or, or 58 me 7 are iconic cards of the greatest of all time. They're not, you know, especially like a 61. Okay. This card is okay. I get why there's focus on this card, but for the card to go from, you know, about $400,000 to 1.6 million in one sale, right. We're seeing it in Pokemon and, and, and magic and other cards where the, the cards are going up in factors, like last sale was 700,000. So the next sale is 1.4 million. The next sale is 2.8. I think it's monopoly money that these guys are playing with. They're looking to flip it quick. So, you know, it's, they're not thinking of this as a long-term investment. Um, 
Another one last night that went you know through the roof was the 33 roof, so $32,000 for a four uh, sold for 93000 so a factor of three. And again, this card was a little bit affected in 2016. You see it going from a $10,000 card to a $26,000 card. Again, almost triple in value then, and then it does a similar thing here, just on a much bigger scale. So this is a mirroring the 2016 event all again. And what happened after 2016? Well, it went from $26,000 to around you know, 14 to 15,000. So again, if you bought in this time period, you lost money um, compared to now you've made money, right? So is the moral of the game, you just never sell and you just, or you only sell when the price really spikes. Who knows when that's gonna happen again? Um, right now, um, you know, and I'll kind of end with why this is bad for collectors. One more card, just another point here is you know, again, a 55 tops. And again, this card wasn't targeted in 16. So you can see that it was very flat. And then you get to this year, the card goes through. And this is a seven, by the way. Okay, guys, this is a seven. It was a nice seven. Show you a photo of it. You know, I don't mind the card itself. It was pretty good. Um, it's hard to see in that photo. Um, let's see if I, yeah, if I can blow it up here a little bit. Yeah, there we go. So it was a nice card, okay? You know, centered oh, pretty pretty good. Um, you know, you can see the Dean corners. Um, but again, perfectly good seven. It's an old grade. You know, you could regrade it. I'm not sure this would get into seven five with those corners. Um, but again, you know, perfectly good high end seven. So again, last sales were in the two thousand dollars. So if this brought three thousand or even four thousand, you could say could be okay brought $5,000 seems very, very high for a card that wasn't targeted. So this is goes into that whole, everyone wants maze cards. Now everyone's Aaron cards. So again, um, you know, why is this bad for collectors? And, and so it, it, what it does is this really puts collectors in a box guys. Um, because every collector has, you know, some goals, right? They want to fill their collection with the cards that they need. And so if you're a set collector, right? And, and you needed a 55 maze to finish your set, but you, you know, you were banking on this card being a, you know, $1,500 card max, you know, cause that's what it's been bringing for the last three years, four years. Okay. Now it's $2,000. I can increase my budget a little bit, but at $5,000, you might just decide I'm done with the set. I can't collect. I can't finish the set anymore. I mean, my, the maze is costing me $5,000. The Clemente in a seven is costing me, you know, $20,000. You know, I, I thought together those two cards would cost me, you know, you know, $14,000. So I can't even afford one of those cards, you know, let alone both of them to finish my set. And that's the reality because you want to finish your sets. You know, if you're a player collector, you, your maze collection just, doubled and tripled in value, right? You think, great, but now the holes in my collection just doubled and tripled and, and maybe I can't afford to fill those holes. So you have, it pits us in, and when I say it pits us in a corner, it, it basically makes us do one of three things. We can either pay the prices for the current cards and just suck it up and, and pay more money if we have it. If we can't afford it, do we sell everything and just quit? Because, you know, if I can't finish my set, what do I do with it? Do I just sell it? Um, um, do I sell cards to buy other cards, you know? But that hole that's in your collection now from that card you sold could be so expensive to replace, it's not even worth it. You know, that's why I've seen a lot of collectors tell me is that, you know, to get this one card, I had to sell some other cards, but now those cards are so expensive to replace I can't do it. I used to do this all the time. I used to sell my three to $400 Clementes. I'd sell five of them and buy a fifties Clemente. And that's how I built my collection over time. You know, it was kind of like I put money down on some cards, sell them at a later date, you know, maybe make a little money on them and then take that money and buy a bigger card and then kind of repeat the process. But if I did that, okay, let's say I sold a $300 Clemente and then it went to a thousand dollars, right? Well, I took that money and I invested it into another Clemente that went up too, but now I'm, I can't go back and spend $300 to get that other card back. You know, when that was my budget was around a three to $400 card. That's when I, you know, 
majority of my my collecting time has been buying cards that were about three to four hundred dollars at a time. Now that doesn't give me anything. That that doesn't give me any of the cards I want and the grades I want. And that's the second piece is you're forcing collectors to either pay more or accept lesser condition cards. And and for people, and this is something I want to put out there right away. And, and it's you know, or just you know, it's not right for people to tell other collectors just accept lower grade cards in their collection because they can't afford it. It's not acceptable because you started out with a goal in mind and every collector has a vision of what they want their set to be. And it's horribly disappointing for a collector not to be able to, to, to finish their vision. And regardless if prices go up or not, I feel bad for collectors who have been on this journey for years and years and now they're priced out of finishing what they wanted. And I don't care if it's good for the hobby if prices go up or this is great for these short-term investors. Those collectors that are facing facing these decisions of do I go on or do I stop and sell everything I got? Because I know for a fact as soon as you sell some of those key cards and they're gone and they you know, let's say they go up again, you're done. Those guys aren't getting back in. Those long-time collectors are just gone. Those cards are in the hand of these flippers and they're going into the PWC vault. They're going to be part of some sort of, um, you know, buying group that's going to sell shares of these cards in the future. Um, they're no longer in collections or part of some sort of stock market way of investing in, in the future of the cards. That's fine. Let other folks that want to do that, do that. But for collectors who, who have been on journeys for years, I've been doing this since 1986. If I had to sell my Clemente collection because I, I know I can't afford to finish the set, you know, um, that just, that's to me, it's heartbreaking for some of these guys. I know there's guys out there in this situation where they're looking at their set now thinking like, I can't, I'm done. I, I just can't finish this. And I've spent years and decades of my life trying to put this together and I'm done and I can't finish it. Um, I'm going to sell it. As soon as I sell one big card, you know, it's over because you can't replace it now uh, unless the prices go back down to normal. Um, so that's what we're in. I mean, either you're forcing collectors to accept lower graded cards. And I know that's an option. And in some cases I've, 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 I've kind of done that in my collection, but I know when there's cards on my collection that don't meet my uh, visual appeal and you know, if they have creases or, you know, I just, for certain cards, like 50s and 60s and 70s, I just can't go below a 7. It's just, those cards aren't visually appealing to me. They're definitely not rare enough in those grades to, to not find them. You know, I look at pre-war cards as being, yeah, a 4 or a 5 is great because those cards are actually rare and they're hard to find. Okay. And the prices, right? A 33 Gaudi Ruth in a PSA 4 or 2 to 4 was a great card because... Super expensive, hard to find. And it, it, they, they were very, um, you know, if you find one with a good eye appeal, they were still nice looking cards for what they were, uh, which was super rare, older vintage cards of, of, of key Hall of Famers. Um, so yeah, getting a two or four of those cards, you know, on those cards was still collectible to me. But a 60s maze card and a PSA six or five is not visually appealing. They're not rare prices weren't that high back in the day. So, you know, yeah, they weren't part of my collection and that's just how I collected. That's, that was what I liked. And I did not like 50s, 60s, 70s cards and anything below a PSA eight. I have some sevens for certain cards. I'm realistic about some prices and sevens are still nice cards if you can get a good one. Um, so again, you know, that's where I'm at. Um, but to tell me I should take lower graded cards because everything's too high in price and I should be happy about it that's the part I, I don't think is right to tell a collector, well, since you're can't afford it anymore, just, you know, fill your collection with a bunch of threes and fours and, and, and quit complaining that, you know, that's not right. And I think we have to be understanding that, you know, that collectors are, are, you know, by definition obsessive and it hurts to not be able to finish something. And it hurts to have cards in your collection. You're not really proud of, or that don't meet the condition that you really wanted. And, and again, this is about collectors. This is not about investors. Okay. Investors can go out and do whatever they want. 
you know, do their share sells and you know selling and, and doing all this kind of new way of investing. That's great. That does not have anything to do with a long-term collector. So this is why you know this is this whole pricing thing is good and bad. You know, it's got some great things for people looking to get out right now. It's for you. It's like this major boon. Great. Those guys, I'm very happy for. If you're getting out, if you're retiring, you're done collecting. But for people who've been in it for a while, who are still collecting it and wanting to finish, this is not great. And those guys are hurting now. I, I've, I've gotten lots of emails and messages from friends who are just, you know, heartbroken because they know they'll never finish their set if the prices stay where they are. So, um, but that's where I'm at. I uh, hope to hear your guys' opinions on this. Uh, let me know what you think about the current prices in the last pre-war auction and how this is affecting you as a collector. And I'll talk to you next time. All right, guys. See ya.